People, have you ever seen a city that two countries call their own capital? It's Jerusalem, one of the oldest cities on our planet that has what we know as irreconcilable enemies living in it next to each other. Is it really true? Is it possible for irreconcilable enemies to live for centuries next door to each other? Or are there perhaps more colors in this palette than just black and white? People, the state of Israel was created after the Second World War. And when I was reading the history of Jerusalem, I really had a feeling that it was absolutely like in a computer game. Lately, I can't hear myself away from the conflict of nations. It's a free online PvP strategy game. Just imagine, in this game you can choose a real country, lead this country and fight during the World War III. There are up to 128 players in games in real time simultaneously you can play for weeks to complete. The trick is that you can create your army yourself, choose tanks, jets and even submarines with nuclear weapons on board. And the coolest thing that I like most about this game is that you, as you are the president of your country, you can do what you want, for example you can declare war on other countries or forge alliance with other players and you can choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles and take over the world. This is really cool guys. It's also very convenient that you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile. And today you can get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer only available for 30 days, so don't lose time. Click the link in the description, choose your country and fight your way to victory. Jerusalem's total population is about 1 million people. There is West Jerusalem, the part that is under Israeli control, that's where you arrive if you come by air. We can basically mark this part with one color, because the entire area is controlled by Israel. Then there is East Jerusalem, and here we need a lot of colors on the map, because there are Palestinian neighborhoods that are home to 370,000 people, and there are Israeli neighborhoods that are home to some 200,000 people. And then there are disputed areas. Why so? Because the State of Israel considers Jerusalem in its its entirety to be its undivided capital, while Palestinians see Jerusalem as the future capital of their envisioned state, the State of Palestine, which is, at the moment, only partially recognized. Its present-day territory stretches east of East Jerusalem. Here it is, the notorious West Bank of the Jordan River. The other Palestinian territory is the Gaza Strip, separated from the West Bank by 25 miles of Israeli soil. The two Palestinian territories have no connection to each other. The international status of East Jerusalem Jerusalem remains uncertain till these days. Now, with the unprecedented escalation of the armed conflict, most likely any stranger in East Jerusalem will raise suspicions, at the very least. And that's exactly where our reporter Alex Pototsky is going now. Right behind me, you see East Jerusalem, the Palestinian part of the city. I'm going there today in the hope to talk to some locals, but the situation is so tense there's no telling how it'll go. There we will also see the separation barrier that separates the state of Israel and the territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority. In some places it's a real tall fence, while in others there's no fence at all. Entrance to East Jerusalem is not restricted, but I'm going there at my own risk. See this barrier? Take a closer look. It's a very long, tall concrete wall. It defines where the partially recognized state of Palestine begins and where the state of Israel ends. It stretches for a total of 440 miles and is called the Israeli West Bank Barrier. It's not a borderline, however, and the separation line it draws is but a tentative indication of it. Why tentative? Because its current position is being heavily disputed. The wall was built by Israel, and Palestinians claim that with this wall, Israel isolated about 9% of their land from the rest of the Palestinian territory. On top of that, Israel does not recognize the very existence of the state of Palestine, although it does recognize the Palestinian Authority as a representative in the interests of the Palestinian people. With all these disputes and contention, local life is 
pretty chaotic. It's not like you cross a border and enter the Palestinian territory. Remember, the map with many different colors, marking Palestinian neighborhoods scattered all over the place? Another paradox of life here is that, quite officially, they are policed by another state, i.e. by Israel. So, it's a common thing here to see Israeli police patrolling Palestinian territory. They come in armored vehicles with steel bars covering their windows to prevent them from shattering if the locals throw stones at them. Wait, what? Israeli police patrolling the Palestinian territory? How is that possible? But that's the thing here, that Israel is controlling Arab settlements. Why? Remember the UN plan that recommended the creation of independent Arab and Jewish states at the end of the British Mandate in 1947? The same plan also prescribed a special international regime for the city of Jerusalem that was to be a demilitarized zone, despite the plan. And as soon as the British Mandate ended, five Arab states declared war on their new neighbor, the State of Israel. As a result of that war, the State of Israel took control of West Jerusalem, whilst one of the attackers, i.e. Transjordan, known as Jordan today, took over East Jerusalem. Nineteen years later, as a result of the Six-Day War, Israel took control of East Jerusalem and other territories previously controlled by Jordan. This is how Palestinian settlements ended up being policed by Israel. The majority of the Arabs living here do not like it and do not accept it. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. You mentioned locals throwing stones at the police. Yes. Do they only target police? No, not necessarily, not always. They might throw stones at the cars from the Jewish side or at some tourists who took a wrong turn and ended up in the wrong place by mistake. You know, like when they're using GPS and take a wrong turn? They might end up involved in an incident. But also, that's not necessarily always true. Some villages are okay. But things like this happen too. That's the kind of a Palestinian neighborhood we're going to. It's called al -Isawiyah. We are accompanied by a local guide, Michael. He has warned us right away that it is not safe, and he is honestly quite a bit scared to go himself. Um, let's stay close to the exit, and if you see anything you don't like or feel, any threats, let's go back immediately. I'm afraid you realize there's a threat only when... when it's too late. In every neighborhood, people react differently to strangers. Some are quite friendly, while others are not. This could be related to people's personal history, like if some locals got arrested by the Israeli police, or if there was a skirmish, especially if it involved shooting. Locals can be expected to be less friendly to any intruder. al according to Michael, is not the most peaceful of neighborhoods. The local muezzin here in al Isawiyah was arrested a few days ago for calling on the local population to join the fight of the Palestinian people against the Zionist aggression, you know? As you can see, this is a densely populated area. It's a large neighborhood with about 20,000 people living here. It is partially located in East Jerusalem and partially in Palestine. This here is the borderline between the two parts. Most people living here don't have Israeli passports because they believe they are living under Israeli occupation, which is why showing up here in a car with an Israeli license plate is pretty dangerous. The neighborhood we just showed you is called al -Isawir. It's a Palestinian neighborhood. It's right now on our left. Michael says it's currently a pretty risky place to go. The access is not restricted, so we'll try to go in and look around a bit. We'll stay in the car and we will be very cautious, because in view of the recent events, one has to be very careful. Welcome to Isaiah. We see concrete blocks along the road to al -Isawir. They are here so that the locals could block the entrance any time. We don't know what kind of welcome to expect here. We are now in al -Isawir, and it's quite obvious that it's a Palestinian neighborhood. 
people look and dress differently. The cars are parked everywhere. It looks pretty much like a poor neighborhood, to be honest. I see some parking lots. You know what? Let's leave. As you can see, all the store signs here are in Arabic. I'm hiding the camera to attract less attention. I saw one big guy by a store give us a look when we were passing by, so I guess we should just go back to safety now. If we go further, we'll go deep into the Palestinian neighborhoods and we feel like we shouldn't risk it. The streets look empty, although some businesses are open. You can now see the fence marking the line separating Israel and the Palestinian territory. <laughs> Uh, are you okay? All good? <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let's go to Abu Tor now. It's it's a lot safer. It's just the same. Just the same? Yep. Abu Tor is a much quieter area because under normal circumstances, it's a tourist destination. And there's a lot more police here in the streets to protect all the visitors. There are many Christian sacred sites there, including the Mount of Olives. There are almost no tourists now, but generally it's the place where many people go to enjoy a scenic view of Jerusalem from up high. There used to be a village there. The problem now is that since there are no tourists, there is no police protecting them. See this building with an Israeli flag. It's either a police station or an army quarters. All windows are protected by reinforced bars. The roof is also protected by bars and barbed wire. That's how they make sure no one can enter through the roof or throw something on top. Uh, We've arrived in East Jerusalem. We'll leave the car parked and continue on foot. Probably the first thing that catches the eye in East Jerusalem is the local cars with flat tires, with all sorts of damage. And check out this local know-how, I guess. A slide bolt latch with a padlock on car trunks. Another typical sight here is a supermarket trolley chained to a fence with a padlock. In the end, none of our fears came true, and even though the streets were quite empty, we haven't encountered any signs of aggression towards us in a Palestinian neighborhood while we were there. This is one of the most visited sites in this neighborhood, with a view to the famous Mount of Olives. This is one of the oldest cemeteries in the world. Legend has it that when the world ends, the dead buried in this cemetery will rise. This will be the first place where the dead will rise. As we keep walking, everything seems peaceful and safe. The neighborhood actually reminds me of a typical Russian town, with the same kind of trash containers, chaotically parked cars, a taxi van stopping to let some people off. But the locals have noticed our camera very quickly and are starting to pay attention. Well, here we are, in the Palestinian neighborhood, Abu Tor. We've walked around and tried to find some people who would agree to talk on camera for us. So far, we've had no luck. First of all, because hardly anyone speaks English around here, while, quite understandably, Hebrew is not an option. Everyone speaks Arabic around here. Another reason is that also, quite understandably, people are scared to speak on camera. We are now in a small shop where I used Google Translate service to translate from English to Arabic that I'm looking for people to speak on camera. We hit a wall. The locals seem to be very wound up and expecting some trouble absolutely anywhere. And I can understand them. We won't tell you anything. There's a war going on. Do you understand? I won't tell you anything. But then his hospitality instincts kicked in and the shop owner promised to help us. 
So it's probably a better idea to sit and wait a bit here for a bit of luck than to roam the streets asking passers-by to talk to us. So we decide to wait, although we have no idea who this man will bring to us, if anyone. This neighborhood offers an amazing view of Jerusalem and its old city. This is where you can see with your own eyes why this place has been in the center of an underlying conflict for so long. This is the old city of Jerusalem. See this big golden dome? It's the Dome of the Rock, a mosque that is part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. And both mosques are the most important Islamic shrines. And it's a holy site for all Palestinians who are predominantly Muslim. However, this Islamic religious compound is located on the Temple Mount, which is venerated as a holy site in Judaism, which means it's extremely important to Israel. One of the Temple Mount's retaining walls is yet another site in Judaism, the famous Wailing Wall. So basically, key holy sites of two different religions are located one on top of another here, which is why this place has been at the core of all disputes between Jews and Arabs. To make the picture complete, I'll add that the very same Temple Mount is also a most revered holy site for yet another religion, i.e. Christianity. And just a five minute walk from here is the ultimate holy place for all Christians, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And all of these holy places are located on a small patch of land called the Old City of Jerusalem. This tiny area is divided into four uneven quarters, one dedicated to a different confession, Muslim quarter, a Jewish one, a Christian one, and smallest of all, an Armenian one. And so, we see here a mix of very different population groups. Naturally, conflicts happen because there are many disagreements. And some of these people have got some pretty extreme views on things. Yet, on the other hand, I can give you lots of examples when people of different confessions work together, go to each other's weddings, to each other's birthdays, and so on. So, the most contentious part in East Jerusalem is the Temple Mount, that has holy shrines revered both in Islam and Judaism, located literally next to each other. Both Jews and Arabs consider it their own. Another important thing to remember is that the law is enforced here by Israel. So, any skirmishes here involve confrontation of two different religions, which only adds more fuel to the flames of the prolonged dispute. In 1996, when Israel opened a second entrance into the Western Wall Tunnel under the Temple Mount, Palestinians took it as an attack on Muslim shrines. The resulting riots left 15 Israelis and 52 Palestinians dead, although some sources suggest that there may have been considerably more victims. In 2000, Israel's soon-to-be Prime Minister's visit to the Temple Mount was met with a violent response from Palestinians that led to a major uprising that lasted for five years, involved major loss of human life, and saw lots of sanctions introduced. All in all, this place is a real tinderbox, and yet, considering its importance for several major world religions, pilgrims have been coming here from all corners of our planet despite all the tensions. This is what this place looks like under the normal circumstances. This is an ultimate tourist destination, and it's amazing, it's so super cool. You walk these streets and you see so many people speaking different languages like French, Italian and so on. You see Catholics, Jews, Arabs, Muslims, and they all walk and talk together, making jokes, taking pictures. And now it's completely empty. If you want to search for this place in Google or look up posts by people who visited Israel on Facebook or on other platforms, you'll see this place crowded. And now it's a desert, no less a real desert, completely empty. I've never seen Jerusalem so empty. To be honest, I didn't think we'd go here because, you know, it's, it's not the safest time to be walking around here because, as you know, East Jerusalem has a large Arabic population and it's been unsafe there. Just a few days ago, they attacked and shot at the police, you know? Kirill is taking us through the old Jerusalem's Jewish quarter. In order to get to the Wailing Wall, we'll have to go the long way because the shortcut goes directly through the Arab quarter and Kirill would rather not go there. If you follow the signs, the sign over there will tell you it's the way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But it's also the way to the Arab markets. It's a super touristy place. So if you ever come to Israel in a time of peace, it's the place to go, to walk around, to see it and feel it. It's a must on your visitors list. Right now, it's not a great idea, because there's a war going on. 
There's police and increased security, you know? The Israel security agency is at work. So, we'll walk through the Armenian quarter, the way all Jewish tourists usually go, because it's safe for us to go there. So, follow me. Okay, but why is it not safe to go through the Arab quarter now? Why is it not safe? Because we know that there's been a conflict escalation, and this conflict didn't start yesterday. This conflict is over 70 years old. It's the Arab-Israeli conflict. The city is literally empty. Only a few tourist shops seem to be open. Here, for example, they sell magnets with the Star of David and some funny t-shirts. Look, these two say Jujutsu and Pikachu, but there aren't any shoppers. There is a huge setback in tourism. On the other hand, one has to understand that many tourist guides who normally take tourists on tours have been called up by the army. Many reservists have been called up. They are now in the army and their job is now there. They are protecting all these sites and the things they will be taking tourists to and telling them about when it's all over. Oh, I can hear some planes in the air. There's probably some mission underway. There is a security barrier close to the Wailing Wall, just like in an airport or at a state border. A steel fence with bars and spikes on top, CCTV cameras all around and metal detectors. Oh, usually this place is swarming with people, tourists. No people now. Only a handful of those who are not afraid to come to Jerusalem's old city. They are praying for peace. I guess we'll see how that works out. We go on to find out that behind the wall there are lots of passages and chambers. And even now, there are some people there. Here's the place where they keep the Torah scrolls. These Torah scrolls are used for public readings during services every week. It's the Hebrew Bible, simply put. And so these Torah scrolls are read from on certain days of the week, on Monday, on Thursday, and on Saturday, i.e. the Sabbath. Each time they read a chapter from the Torah corresponding to that particular week and that particular day. Over there, see that man standing? That's where they keep the Psalms, also in scrolls. I mean, the Book of Psalms, written by King David. Kirill says that even this number of visitors is nothing compared to normal times. Indeed, just take a look at some pictures taken before the escalation. On the other hand, there is a certain benefit to empty streets. There are no crowds of tourists obstructing the view everywhere. You can see everything clearly. Yet, on the other hand, you can't help but realize just how much tension there is in the air. Kirill refused to accompany us to this quarter. And also, how much tension there is in the entire country. That even this super touristy place, the country's top tourist destination, looks pretty much dead now. The only people willing to talk to us are sellers who are just trying to sell anything. I wanted to go deeper into the Arab quarter, to the mosque, but the police stopped me and told me that non-Muslims are currently not allowed to go in there. In other words, as I understand, if I want to get in there, I need to come from the other side and use another entrance. So I was turned back and I didn't expect this, to be honest. It's the first time ever that I wasn't allowed into a Muslim quarter. Truth be told, to tell a Muslim quarter from a Jewish quarter around here is not an easy task if you are a stranger to the local scene. But if a Jew sees a plastic bag with bread hanging in the street, they'll know they took a wrong turn. This is a very typical thing for a Muslim neighborhood. You see lots of plastic bags around with unused or stale bread because there is a taboo on throwing bread into the garbage. It's not allowed. So these bags can hang out there for a very long time. Here, look, there's one more. 
Another typical sight is what looks like graffiti to us, you know, some stars or flowers of sorts. That's not what it is, however, to Muslims. Most of such signs are an indication that a man who lives here or used to live here went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And so this house must be treated with respect. Michael is also a Jew. He's been living in Jerusalem for over 20 years, and he's not scared at all to walk around the Muslim quarter. You know, if we came here under normal circumstances, especially during the tourist season in October, we'd see here crowds of pilgrims. I mean, not only pilgrims, but lots of tourists too. This place would be swarming with people. Whereas right now, it's completely deserted. And we are the only people on this route. And that's what catches the eye. In addition to this, I'd say that people have not yet recovered from the initial shock. It feels like everyone is struggling to understand what's going on and has no idea what to expect tomorrow. And this takes its toll for sure. In Jerusalem, for example, most children stopped going to school. They're staying at home with their parents. An air attack is still a threat. And during air attacks, when a siren goes off, people have to hide in bomb shelters with their children. And this is why those people who can't work online from home are now staying home without a job or income. This is one more thing that's different now compared to how life used to be. And it's basically the same in Tel Aviv and all the other cities in Israel. You can also see that because of the current situation, there is a massive military presence here. You've seen lots of soldiers on one side and on the other side. And so, since the police is working, protecting us, I feel quite protected, I feel safe. There are lots of quarters and corners in the old city. There's also East Jerusalem, i.e. Palestinian Jerusalem. There are lots of places that are never visited by tourists or even locals who live elsewhere. And it's probably not a good idea to try and go there now. As for the touristy parts of the old city in West Jerusalem, I believe they're as safe as any other place. We are now entering the Arab Quarter through its main entrance, the Damascus Gate. The strangest thing about this gate is that it is in fact considered to be the quarter's most dangerous spot. And it is, in terms of possible terrorist activity, because many terrorist attacks were carried out right here, close to this gate. It's because this place is usually full of all sorts of people. East Jerusalem's main bus station is within a walking distance from here, so it's been easy for, you know, young men wishing to carry out a terrorist attack to arrive here from Judea or Samaria. This is the reason you can see things here that are not typical for the old city in general, such as these guard posts and lots of soldiers. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we're doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal, and we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. The Muslim Quarter is the most densely populated neighborhood in the old city. And my first impression made me wonder where all these people live, because all the houses seem to be pretty small. The tallest are five stories high. The original houses have survived here because people living here didn't have the funds to make any significant changes to their housing. They couldn't afford tearing down old houses to build new ones in their place, so they did what they could. And we can often see some very unusual solutions. For example, a tiny toilet fitted in the corner of a bedroom. Also, you can see additional rooms built on roofs. Many people live in basements and so on. Also, Jerusalem's total population is over 1 million people. 60% of Jews and 40% of Arabs. That's 40,000 people. And those Arabs who live in the Muslim quarter are considered to be poor even compared to Arabs who live elsewhere in East Jerusalem. That's how it's been for a long time. 
All despite the fact that people living here are not paying some crazy money for their houses, the costs are pretty reasonable. That's because most of the houses here don't belong to some people. They belong to a WAC, a charitable fund managed by the Muslim community. And so tenants pay their rents to the WAC. And often the amount is defined by some very old, really old deal. And as a result, it's a very small amount of money. Only during the last 10 or 15 years, I've seen some changes being implemented around here because more tourists have been coming, so they built some new hotels here. A new generation of young, well-educated Arabs has grown up and they are organizing some youth clubs here, working with children and the youth. Okay, look, yes, this is the Muslim quarter. What makes it different from the rest of Israel? Are there some special local rules in place here or something like this? You know, I think, first of all, this place is full of very old, truly ancient buildings that are part of an exceptional historical significance. They are related to humanity's past. And so there are local traditions, I wouldn't say rules, rather traditions, that are not observed in any other places. For example, when someone dies, there is a tradition to carry the deceased through the main streets. I've seen it many times myself. And anyone who is in the way of this procession must stand and pay respect. I also think that people who live here are in a certain way proud of being local residents because it's a historically significant place for them. But if you take a look, you know, even at first glance, you'll see that the life of people who live here is not particularly comfortable. Indeed, in many religions, Jerusalem is considered a place for dying rather than for living. People say that there are way more dead people in Jerusalem than living ones. There's no way to know how many exactly, but it's true that many devout Jews used to come to the Holy Land in order to be buried here. It happened quite a lot in the 18th century and in the first half of the 19th century. Back then, Jerusalem was the place where people moved more to die rather than to live. And since back in the day, life was unpredictable and people didn't know how long they'd live. They used to come here while still relatively well and waited patiently for the day they'd die so they could be buried here. And yet, many of these buildings continue to serve even though they are at least 500 years old. That's because they were built with great care and skill. There's a part of the Muslim quarter up high that we can't see from here, but we can see the rest of it below us. And you can see lots of buildings with domes on their roofs. You know, Mark Twain wrote about Jerusalem. It is as knobbly with countless little domes as a prison door is with bolt heads. These are the domes he was talking about. The thing is, domes are best suited to the local climate along with very thick walls. They help keep the houses cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. From here, we can see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it's very clear from here that it's the highest ground in the city. We can see the multitude of mosques all around. After the sunset, green floodlights will be turned on around the mosques, and then you can see even better how many there are. There's the Christian quarter over there. The streets in the old city of Jerusalem are very narrow. There are no cars here, and all deliveries are made by special carts. Getting a license to operate such a cart isn't easy. Um. You know, I like this quarter very much myself. There are places here that are full of life. And if you look here, there's something I particularly like. Look how colorful it is. They sell lots of multicolored sweets here. And they're not just for tourists, locals buy them too. It tells me that people here like to sweeten up their life a little bit, to add more colors to it. 
And there are lots of shiny things. As you can see, there are many stores selling jewelry, and the people you can see here are not glamorous in any way. There are people here that you'd rather picture as belonging to times long gone, like beggars gathering arms, for example. Or you can see people making deliveries in old worldy carts. That's how all deliveries are made here. And these carts are passed down from generation to generation. There's no other way to get one. They appeared in the early 20th century. Thousands of years haven't been enough for Arabs and Jews to come to some agreement. And yet, ordinary people living next to each other are finding ways to live together, and at the very least, bear each other's presence. Look at this, for example, almost 300,000 worshippers gathered by Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque to attend prayers during the holy month of Ramadan in April this year. Or this, just five days before the Hamas attack on Israel, over 50,000 Jewish worshippers gathered at the way wall to participate in a joint prayer during the Sukkot holiday. Despite the conflicts and a history of mutual enmity between these people, they somehow managed to live next to each other and keep their cultures and traditions intact. Out of 10 million people living in Israel, 2 million are Arabs. And just like Jews, Arabs are a very diverse ethnic group. There are lots of different Arabs and lots of different Jews. So it's hard to talk about hatred or love definitively. Things change all the time. They can hate you in the morning and not so much after lunch, you know? It all depends on overall circumstances and personal circumstances. If we take, for example, public education in Israel, it pays a lot of attention to educating children about tolerance, about racial, national, gender, and all other kinds of equality. Many schools organize events that bring together Arabs and Jews. There is a bilingual school in Jerusalem with classes in both Arabic and Hebrew. There are bilingual summer camps and kindergartens. So, on one hand, we see that a lot of effort is invested in forging closer ties between these two groups of people. On the other hand, however, one of Israel's foundational principles has always been not so much about preventing different groups of populations mixing into one, but rather about preserving the cultural diversity. For example, there is no single system of education. There are Jewish schools and there are Arab schools. There are public secular and public religious Jewish schools. There are Orthodox Jewish schools. There are Muslim schools and Christian schools, including Orthodox Christian schools and Catholic Christian schools. So we basically see a very diverse picture here. Also, since people are free to live wherever they like, they often prefer to live close to the people they can relate to. And thus we have, for example, the city of Ashdod. And there's a neighborhood where Jews from Georgia live, and another neighborhood where Jews from Moscow live. Then a neighborhood of Persian Jews, and an Arab neighborhood where all Arabs belong to a particular clan called Hamula, and so on. In 1948, when Israel had to fight for this land, Jerusalem was first divided in half, with West Jerusalem under Israel's control and East Jerusalem under Jordan's. Since it was an all-out war between Israel and Palestine, there are still many people here who heard a lot about it from their parents. Alex had the chance to see it for himself. While he waited drinking tea, a man came up to him and said he'd found someone who'd agreed to talk on camera. He offered to follow him, and our guys were completely clueless as to where he was taking them. He says there is a man who works with tourists, and he'd like to talk to us. 
Okay, it's not like they'll rob us, right? What? It's not like they'll rob us, I guess. Finally, Alex meets a man who's willing to go on camera. He unlocks the gate to some tunnels and tells us his story. His parents fled here from the war. My family is a Palestinian refugee family. Was, they were living in 48 in a village called Lifta. As we go downstairs, it becomes very cold. It's like a catacomb, a cave where bodies are buried in the walls. So they would place the body inside a cave and come back in a year or two, open the cave, which was usually sealed with a big rock, retrieve the remains and wash the bones. If you know a Russian idiom to wash someone's bones, now you know where it comes from. After that, they would put all the bones in a box carved out of stone called an ossuary. It's usually as long as the longest bone in a person's body, the femur. They would then put the box back in the cave. When someone else in the family died, they would repeat the process all over. Benjamin said he wouldn't go with us since he's old and his legs are no good. He's now taking care of these caves as a memorial site because they literally saved his father's life during the first Arab-Israeli war. They decide to move to this side of the city because of the war, because of the fighting, killing. Uh, how they come here directly, because my father at that time used to work with uh, an office called Hebra Kedisha, who look after the graveyard and bury people in Mount Olive. So he know the area very well. And then there's no houses, no people living around except this spot here. So my father bring them directly to this point here. And they lived into the cave six months. It was winter time. Just imagine living underground for six months, surrounded by dead people in winter, with no electricity, next to no food, no water, and no heat. Benjamin didn't experience that because he was born in 1951, but he did have to use the caves to hide from the bombings. After the six months winter time, he, they went up, they built kind of sheds in the beginning. Now it's houses. We use it in 67 war. Okay. The whole family, we were hiding inside seven days. As you remember, in 1967, Israel took over East Jerusalem, which is why those neighborhoods that Alex went to at the start of this report, as well as the old city, are policed by Israel. And yet, Palestinians insist that they are living under Israeli occupation, while Israel insists that Jerusalem is entirely its own, and no one seems to have a clue how to reconcile the two parties. The issue of Jerusalem is of paramount importance for both Israel and Palestine. A solution that would satisfy both parties does not exist, which is why, according to our guide, Michael, no one knows how this war is going to end. Israel after the October 7th attack, Israel decided that living next to a force like this while maintaining a normal life is impossible. We've been living in a tinderbox, waiting for it to burst into flames all this time, you know? So, what will happen after Hamas is dealt with? How is it going to be dealt with? Are they going to arrest its leaders or perhaps all members? And then who and how? All these questions don't seem to have clear answers. And so all this remains unclear, not only to ordinary citizens, but also to those who are commanding this war today, I think. It is also clear that any kind of solution, like expelling all Palestines to the Gaza Strip or anything as extreme, is out of the question. It's completely out of the question. So, if you want to choose your own strategy in gaining epic battles and take over the world, Conflict of Nations is the best game for you. It's a free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare.
And I'd like to remind you that today you get an exclusive gift. So click the link in the description, download this game, and you will get 15,000 of gold for free. And you also get a one month of premium subscription also for free. This offer is available only for 30 days, so don't lose time. Click the link in the description, choose your country, and find the way you want to victory. As we were saying goodbye to Benjamin, a Palestinian who hid from the air raids in a catacomb, and our cameras were already off, he said a very wise thing. Peace cannot come from the outside. Only war can come from the outside. True peace is born within, in one's heart. Peace to all. Subscribe to our channel 